Hello, everybody. It's nice to see people are tuning in nice and early. It's Joan. Nice to see you. Welcome back again, Yorkie, from Harlem in the Netherlands. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, Shelley, yes, I think we all agree with that. It's a very sad, very sad time and a very sad day. And uh, I don't think you'll find many people disagreeing with you. Robert tells us it's stormy in Fort Lauderdale. Yes, well, if you will live in the hurricane zone, this is what happens. Here in Pittsburgh, we either get hot and humid or incredibly wet. But um, fortunately, the hurricanes tend not to reach us so far. But who knows what climate change will bring. Hello, John Henry and Linda. Yes, Linda, you're right. All desert's dry indeed. <laughs> As we've had the most, for those of you who aren't in Pittsburgh, we've had the most beautiful weather for the last while. We, we had a run of about five days without a cloud in the sky and no humidity. It was just beautiful. It would fool you into believing that Pittsburgh had a nice climate. Yes, indeed, and we are in a drought. Hello, David in Stratford-upon-Avon. Welcome back. Lovely to have you joining us. I know my friend, the the uh, the wonderful actor David Bradley, who I directed in Beckett's uh, in Beckett's um, Endgame at one point. He lives in Stratford on Avon. I know he's worked a lot with the RSC and, and Harry Potter movies. But if you happen to bump into him, just say hi to him from me. Hello, James, Mary Ann. Yes, David Bradley, Mr. Fitch. One of the nicest people you could ever wish to meet. He always plays monsters. He was, uh, what was he in Game of Thrones? Um, the one who, who ran the Red Wedding, him, yes. He's always playing nasty people. And he's such a sweetheart. Thank you, Sarah, and a joyous weekend to you too. Although for us in the theater, the weekend doesn't exist. It's a strange anomaly, but the, uh, the working week for the professional actor is Tuesday through Sunday, and the working week for the working producer is Monday through Saturday. So that means I never get a day off. It's just so sad, so sad, and nobody cares. Nobody has pity for me. <laughs> Yeah, David, is, David Bradley has played just about everything horrible you could ever wish for. I think it's something to do with the way he looks. But as I say, he's a sweetheart. Hello, Grace. Yes, well, autumn is a, definitely would be arriving in Dublin by about now. Um, you get it earlier than we do. We're not supposed to go into August, uh, autumn until October. Although I can see a little brown on the leaves of the trees around my my house now. It's beginning to come. I think it's the lack of water more than the season change. Oh, David, thank you. That's good to know. Uh, do say hello to him from me and remind him that he played the most wonderful clove in Endgame that you could ever wish for. You see, one of the wonderful things about the internet and, and all of these international webinars that we can do, because once you put it up there, anybody in the world can tune in. And if you have friends in anywhere in the world, tell them to tune in. Uh, but you do meet, you meet up with people, you know, this, 
six degrees of separation usually breaks down to two degrees of separation. Uh, so it is wonderful the people that you discover you know and uh, you build friendships. I know Facebook is something we all choose to hate, but it does have its advantages as well, as does Twitter and Instagram and all the other things. But Webinar Ninja rules, because that's where you find Pit Classic Theatre every Friday. Hello, John in Toronto. And Greg, hi, welcome. And all others that I'm missing because it tends to go past while well, I'm busy talking. Yes, <laughs> yes, the ever present uh, voice of Picked comes up and reminds you we are there too on every other outlet. You can follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, uh, and on Facebook, of course. And uh, and if you want infinitely more information, let us have your email and we will keep you abreast of everything that we're doing because I've got news about that in a few moments. Um, oh, Varun, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, from sunny and wild, fiery California. I hope you're safe. Uh, it really is dreadful what's happening to the West Coast at the moment. I mean, it looks like the entire West Coast is on fire. And certainly Oregon and the northern half of California, it's just terrible what's happening. One of the hideous things, I mean, from flood, you can usually recover something, but from fire, everything is gone. Your entire life is gone, and it's, it's so tragic. Hello, Dennis. Welcome back from Greensburg. Oh, just one more minute or so, and then I've got a couple of announcements to make. Hello, Mimi. And uh, and then we'll uh, we'll go on with the uh, the King Lear adventure. Um, for those of you for whom such things as cleanliness, neatness, and tidiest matter, you will notice that I have finally, after several months, had a haircut. It wasn't easy. It took a lot of personal sacrifice, but I made the effort, and I think I look a teeny bit tidier than I have done for quite a while. And another from Florida. I hope it's not so stormy where you are. John, I agree with you. Haircuts are completely overrated. But sometimes, you know, you have to sort of put up a, a, a reasonable appearance. You know, when you're going, you're going to a bank and asking for money, it looks better if you've got a haircut, I think. Uh, yes, indeed, Patricia, I do, I do look groomed. I do. I do. I dress up well. Sometimes I even wear a suit and a tie, although not very often. I used to wear bow ties all the time, but um, uh, real ones. I mean, I tie myself and that kind of thing. But uh, then I think, I think as the years passed, I began to realise that there were better things to do in the morning than to tie a tie. So I stopped doing it. So anyway, um, uh, I will try. But I uh, can't guarantee. I was just a, a, a query coming in. Uh, some people, when I'm talking about uh, the plays um, and I make quotes out of them, um, I, I just have my quotes and a lot of them are in my head and a few of them are jotted down. Um, so I sometimes can't give act and scene numbers um, simply because I don't have them in my head or jotted down. Uh, but anyway, you shouldn't be reading the play. You should be listening to me. So... What the hell? Uh, my advice when you when I finish is always go away and read the play. And this is an opportunity because we're doing three programs on there that you could read it three times. And that wouldn't do you any harm at all. There's a lot to be learned. Yes, Karen, once a year I think is quite sufficient. It's like the old story of Queen Elizabeth I who took a bath every year whether she needed it or not. Uh, 
So, um, hello, Michael from Point Park. How are you? Good to see, good to see you there. Right. Uh, okay. Well, I think it's about time we made a start. Now, I want a couple of announcements to make before we get into the actual talk. Yes, now, that's the other thing I forgot to do last week early enough, which is to turn down the volume. We've been listening to some rather delightful Elizabethan and pre-Elizabethan music. Um, first of all, uh, I want to thank Arnold de Carolus, who has been the sponsor for all three of these programs, last week, this week, and next week. Thank you so much, Arnold. It's, it makes such a difference to know that we've got the basic financial security to, to put these together, because in spite of the fact it's just me or sometimes a couple of guests, it still costs money to put these on. So I am deeply grateful Arnold has uh, sponsored last week, this week, and next week. And if you are interested in sponsoring, please send us an email, get onto us through the website, and we'll give you all the details that you need. Uh, and we do, we, we, we let people know that you are our sponsor if you so choose. And if you want to do it anonymously, we can do that as well. Um, now, for those of you who follow us on social media, you may have noticed that we have started on our uh, on the production of our, our radio drama series. We are we are actually in the recording of the first one at the moment. While we when we finish this, I'm off back down to the studio for the uh, for the next day of recording. Um, we'll have a lot more news about that next week. We're going to make the announcement next week of what we're doing, how you tune into it, how you get hold of it. Um, and how you buy a ticket for it. And we are making sure that everybody can buy a ticket because we're keeping the price very, very low. Uh, we are basically trying to cover the costs of production. We want to bring you theatrical entertainment. We can't put it on a stage. We can't bring you together into an auditorium. So we're going to have it on your computer. You will be able to listen to a radio play in the good old fashioned way that radio plays were was produced. More news about that will be coming next week, both from me and on social media and on emails if you're on our emailing list. Um, on that point, I, we're, we're a little bit proud of ourselves, so forgive us. We are the first professional theatre company in Pittsburgh who have been authorised and approved by American Actors' Equity to resume production. Um, there's a lot of us in Pittsburgh. We're very proud of the fact that we were the first allowed back uh, mostly because of the degree of safety precautions that we've taken for our artists. We want our artists to work, we want to give them the opportunity to, to do their art, to, 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 uh, to present drama to you, but we wanted to make sure that they were absolutely safe while doing it. And, let it be said, that I was absolutely safe as well. So all of those things, all those things were taken into consideration and uh, the union approved us, so we're very proud of that. It's an immense responsibility because, uh, as we all know, in this terrible time of COVID, bringing people together in any way, shape or form is a huge risk. So um, we, we've taken every precaution we can to make sure our actors are safe. And because of that, we will be producing, presenting. Uh, you will have some theatre art coming from us over the airwaves. And uh, as I say, more information about that next week. So let's, uh, let's get down to King Lear again. Now, last week we talked, as I, as I said, the, the, the whole premise of King Lear is a sequence of journeys. Uh, just about everybody in the play is on a journey. I mean, even the servant Oswald is on a, a journey, uh, carrying a letter which is on a journey. So this notion of the journey is, is the, the dominant factor in the play. But for the major characters, the journey is very, very subject specific. Lear's journey from absolute authority to becoming absolute nothing. The realization that everything he believes himself to be is false, is nonsense. And to make this overwhelming discovery of the true nature of man, a poor bare forked animal, which is what he sees with, with Mad Tom. Um, and this journey drives him quite literally, it drives his wits away. We call it madness. It is said, you know, he is mad, the mad King Lear. It is not so much madness, but it is that point of which where you go beyond false reality and start coming to terms with the appalling nothingness that you actually are. And that can tip you over into a kind of insane behavior or an in what we might call an insane thinking, but in fact, very often has uh, has a phenomenal degree of truth and perception and understanding in it. 
Now, the second major character of the play is the subject of, the, of, of what one might call the, the, the subplot. I don't like the, uh, the term subplot. Uh, Shakespeare often uses them, and he is a genius of them. Uh, some plays don't have it. Macbeth, for instance, has no subplot. Romeo and Juliet has no subplot. It's just the topic of the play. But in Lear, there is a very precise and clear, and I prefer to use the term, parallel story. It runs completely in parallel with the Lear story, and it is intermingled at various points with the Lear story. And yet it is of itself its own specific and particular journey. And it is the journey of Gloucester. Gloucester, the Earl of Gloucester. Now, a tiny little point, by the way, and it is important. Uh, you have the Duke of Cornwall, um, uh, the Duke of Albany, and you have the Earl of Gloucester. Uh, in in British um, uh, nobility, and it's still there, um, the Duke was the closest thing to the King. Very often, brothers, sisters, or cousins of the King. Um, and it's a much newer title, but the title Earl goes way back, pre-Norman, goes into Saxon times. And that's why you'll sometimes see somebody with the title, the, the fifth Duke of such and such, 19th Earl of somewhere else. Uh, the title Earl is very ancient, but it is a much lower one in hierarchy. And Shakespeare uses this very specifically in this play. Gloucester is the Earl of Gloucester. Cornwall is the Duke of Cornwall. Uh, it gives Cornwall more authority. So Gloucester and his journey is a very different journey to that of Lear, and yet it has the same purpose, which is to teach, to for Gloucester to learn truth, just as Leah learns truth about his nature, about what he is. Gloucester uh, has to learn the truth of the world around him. Gloucester thinks he sees and understands everything, understands it all. In fact, he is completely blind to the truth of the world his world, the world he lives in. And he has to go on this terrible journey. He got to, because in order to gain true sight, he must go blind. One might almost say that he's blind at the very start of the play. And as I say, he has to lose his eyes before he can see properly. Indeed, the mad Lear will tell him with when, when they meet on the heath and uh, we, we, we looked at that scene last week, uh, the mad king will tell him with incredibly sane understanding that a man may see how the world goes with no eyes. You just have to listen. And what you hear will very often tell you more truth than what you think you see. Listening is one of the hardest things that we ever do in life, and Shakespeare understood that. None of us do it properly. Still, today, in, in the 21st century, we still don't listen. Uh, we hear things, but we don't actually listen to them properly. Um, so anyway, at the start of the play, Gloucester has great certainty. He is, uh, I, I, I would put it this way, as far as he's concerned, the gods are in their heavens, the king is on his throne, and all's right with the world. It's a classic sort of naive political opinion of the way the world works. And when we're young, when we're, when we're young, we often believe that everything seems to work fine because, you know, you, you get up in the morning, somebody feeds you, you go to school, and so you come home, somebody feeds you again, you go to bed and you're safe. Everything's okay in the world. It's only as we grow that we begin to realize and value just how fragile that arrangement actually is. And that, and again, a, a phrase that I, I, uh, I, I used before, about the nature of chaos. The chaos is always waiting just below the surface. And that if you break the fragility of order, chaos ensues. So Gloucester again, he's not at the beginning of the play very certain uh, of how the king is gonna divide up his kingdom, but that's not his responsibility. His responsibility is to respond to orders. He is the perfect civil servant. He does as the king commands. And 
king, the king's first line. Lear's very first line in the play is an order to Gloucester, attend the lords of France and Burgundy. And that's exactly what Gloucester does, runs off to attend to the lords of France and Burgundy. By the time he comes back into the room, the world has turned upside down. He's been out, run down the corridor, told the two guys, listen, the king's ready to see you, follow me. And he comes back into the room and Cordelia has been completely disinherited and Kent, the king's favorite, the king's bannerman, the king's champion has been banished. And all Gloucester did was walk out the door, pick up a couple of guys and bring them back in. But in that short space of time, his work has turned upside down. It's not what he expected not what he foresaw. His expectations are always based on order. And he's about to enter this world where his notion of civilization is going to be demolished. And when this happens, chaos ensues. Gloucester represents to us in this play the awfulness that chaos can produce. Now, also in this opening sequence, we see that he has a particular love for his bastard son, Edmund makes a, a passing reference uh, to his legitimate heir, Edgar, but he very clearly sees and believes that Edmund is, I suppose, more fun. Um, just like, as he says, the getting of him. There was much sport in his making, he says to Kent. The, the, there is a kind of delight. If there was a twinkle in Gloucester's eye, it is the memory of that brief and, and delightful moment in which Edmund was was uh, uh, was created, and Edmund stays as a point of affection in his mind. Now remember, being the bastard son, being a legitimate, Edmund has no rights, no inheritance. Edgar is the next Duke of Gloucester. It is very fair to say that Gloucester is truly, how would you put it, easily led. Um, it's as though he only ever sees the surface of a situation never the chaos that lies underneath it. As I said, that, that absolute certainty that in our innocence, everything is all right. And it is only with experience and wisdom we begin to discover the fragility of that certainty. Chaos always lies beneath. Lear's division of the kingdom is a reckless move. But Gloucester, as far as Gloucester is concerned, it's the king's right to do whatever he wants. He's the king. If he says this is this, this is this. If he says the moon is the sun, then the moon is the sun. He's sort of part of Lear's support mechanism. And it's that mechanism that maintains Lear's belief in his own authority. The fact that when he says something and somebody like Gloucester says yes, Lear says jump, Gloucester says how high, that is the false, that feeds the false perception that Lear had of himself. And it is Gloucester's unwillingness or inability to see the reality of Lear. That, and that's where I say the two plots interlink so beautifully. He, as I say, has a, a uh, Gloucester has a, a blind faith in the gods and the fates. They, to his mind, are what give order to the world that makes things clear and simple. It is the gods, it is the fates, this is the way it works. And when they go out of their natural rhythm, only then does he show concern. He, uh, this beautiful line, that these late eclipses of the sun and moon portend no good to us. It's a clear indication that he believes that there is a, a natural order to things and that these can be predicted and that these can be certain. He trusts in astrology, which his son Edmund completely laughs at uh, uh, a short while be before this uh, or after this. Um, but it is, it is, again, Gloucester perceiving the world, seeing the world down a very narrow tube of vision. But he's noticed that there are strange things happening in the stars. Uh, love cools, friendship falls off, brothers divide in cities, mutinies, in countries, discord, in palaces, treason, and the bond cracked with son and father. We have seen the best of our time. He can see these things happening, but it does not change him. He accepts it as part of the order of the universe that sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but there's nothing we can do about it. So we just accept it. 
He can see the problems, but he cannot see the cause. So, when the bastard son, Edmund, presents him with a very dubious piece of evidence against his legitimate son, Edgar, he doesn't delve, he doesn't question, he doesn't doubt. He sees only the surface, and on that basis, he disinherits Edgar and gives Edmund Edgar's place in the line of inheritance on a very, very flimsy sequence of evidence. Edmund is brilliant. Edmund is a brilliant, brilliant mind. And Edmund's journey, which we'll talk about next week, is, is one of the most exciting. Edmund arrives, and he's got a letter in his hand. And Gloucester says, what is, what news, what news? So please your lordship, none, says Edmund. Well, why do you why so earnestly seek you to put up that letter? I know no news, my lord. This is genius. This is how to convince somebody of, of something by denying it. What needs that terrible dispatch of it to your pocket? Come, let me see. If it be nothing, I shall not need spectacles. And Edmund, working, working the mechanism so beautifully that Gloucester cannot see. I beseech you, sir, pardon me. It's a letter from my brother that I've not all or read and find not fit for your raw looking. Brilliant. Brilliant in his understanding of his father's weakness. Edmund is a far better politician than his father could ever be. Gloucester says, give me the letter. Edmund defends his brother. I hope for my brother's justification he wrote this, but as an essay or taste of my virtue or a joke. The letter itself is a brilliant piece of invention. This policy of reverence to age makes the world bitter, keeps our fortunes from us. I begin to find an idle and fond bondage in the oppression of age tyranny. Come to me that I may speak more. If our father, now this is the key one, if our father should sleep till I waked him, you should enjoy half his revenue and forever and live the beloved of your brother, Edgar. Sleep till I waked him. He's not talking about waking up. He's talking about wake in the Irish sense. He should sleep until we carry out his wake and funeral. In other words, if we kill him, you'll enjoy half the benefits of him being dead. It's a brilliant letter. And Gloucester, only looking at the surface, says the, 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 the instant word that Edmund actually prays for, conspiracy. He immediately assumes the letter is true. He doesn't investigate, he doesn't consider, he doesn't look at the implications, he doesn't doubt. He only sees the surface. Brilliant piece of innuendo in this letter. And Gloucester cannot see that. He has no, I suppose you might say he's got no sense of humor. He then asks him, where did you come to this? Who brought it? And Edmund's reply again, genius. It was not brought me, my lord. There's the cunning. I found it thrown in at the casement of my closet, thrown in the window of my bedroom. See, Edmund makes Gloucester... Uh, he makes Gloucester force the information out of him. He'll defend his brother in order to condemn him. It's quite, quite brilliant. Is this, Gloucester asks, is this your brother's handwriting? And Edmund says, I think it is. I hope it isn't. It is his hand. I hope his heart is not in the contents. But I have heard him say that sometimes, you know, when kids grow up, their fathers should just retire and let them take over. He does it so beautifully that Gloucester believes everything. Villain, he calls Edgar. Abhorred villain, unnatural, detested, brutish villain, worse than brutish. Seek him out, I'll apprehend him. Gloucester never actually sees the truth because, as I say, all of this is on the surface. This is going to be his downfall. So just in the way, again, going back to the parallel thought, Lear disinherits, disinherits Cordelia out of a narcissistic rage. Gloucester disinherits Edgar out of a blind disregard for what we would now call due process and for having faith in completely rigged evidence. Two very foolish old men. And the results are immediate, catastrophic. Um, just as 
the seat of power from Lear shifts instantly to Goneril and to Regan and to their husbands, uh, uh, Albany and Cornwall. In this sense, the seat of power shifts uh, rather importantly for Gloucester. Edgar has been condemned. Edmund is now the true son. And Gloucester, because of the consequences of Lear's abdication, comes much, much more under the sway of Regan and her husband, Cornwall. So you've had this huge political shift happening that, again, unsteadies that absolute certainty that Gloucester has in the way the world works. Suddenly, he's got a king because King has said, we retain the name of king and we, we retain the, the authority as king. We just give away all the responsibility, all the hard work. But now Gloucester has become doubtful of his, uh, well, not doubtful, but condemning his, his true heir, uh, having to elevate Edmund and now coming under the very profound influence of Cornwall and more importantly, of Regan. Edmund is actually elevated by Cornwall and set off on what will become his own journey towards power. And of course, Gloucester's blindness to this will cost him very, very dearly. Edgar, the, the innocent, is immediately condemned by Cornwall as well. In other words, with no evidence whatsoever, but merely by accusation of the one person who, who benefits from it, his brother Edmund, Edgar is now an outcast. He's fallen from rank and therefore safety, just like Cordelia has. But in, in Edgar's case, he doesn't have a king of France to step in and save him. So he becomes the fugitive, which is in Shakespeare, I suppose, a symbol for all who are unjustly condemned. It happens a lot in Shakespeare, this notion that a false accusation is made and you are now a fugitive. Um, sometimes it happens in comedies, you know, where you have uh, in As You Like It, um, Orlando is condemned simply because um, the new Duke didn't like his father um, and he becomes a fugitive and has to go. His brother throws him out. He has to run. Fugitives happen a lot and it is always an indication of unjust and unfair judgment. He actually, uh, there's a rather beautiful speech. I'll, I'll read you some of it. Um, Edgar, as, I mean, imagine this. You've gone within an hour from being authoritative, respected, regarded, the heir to the estate, the, the, you know, the next boss in line. And within an hour, you are an outcast, a fugitive, and if you are seen, you are dead. I heard myself proclaimed and by the happy hollow of a tree escaped the hunt, hiding in a tree. No port is free, no place that guard and most unusual vigilance do not attend my taking. I can't show my face, but they'll pick, uh, take me. So he has to make a choice. Reason it out or run. And he does the wise thing. While I may escape, I will preserve myself and am bethought to take the basest and poorest shape that ever penury and contempt of man brought near to beast. I'll, my face I'll grime with filth, blanket my loins, elf all my hair in knots, and with presented nakedness outface the winds and persecutions of the sky. I'll become a beggar. And not just a beggar, a mad beggar. I will reduce myself from the position and rank and authority that I had to the lowest of the low. Now it's an interesting parallel because Lear had to go from a position of absolute authority to discover himself to be fundamentally nothing. And the example of fundamental nothing that he chose or that nature chose for him or fate was this mad bedlam beggar that Edgar has become. The mad Tom that Lear sees and says, thou art the thing itself, unaccommodated man, is nothing more but such a poor bare folk animal as thou art, is the very thing that Edgar in this moment chooses to become. He realizes that the safest place for anyone to be the safest thing for anyone to be is to be nothing. The very thing that Lear has to go on a hard journey to discover. So there again, you've got this parallel going on all the time. 
So he becomes a bedlam beggar. He behaves like a madman. You know, mortify, they, they, they mortify their bare arms with pins, wooden pricks, nails, sprigs of rosemary. They behave mad, and that's why people shun them. People don't go near them. And the safest place is to be shunned with nobody to go near you. Poor Tom, that's what he becomes. Poor mad Tom. Edgar, I nothing am. In a sense, you know, um, Ed, he's like the partisan in Leonard Cohen's song, has to keep changing location, changing place, changing face to stay safe, to stay alive. He has to appear to be that which he is not. But his father, Gloucester, is completely blind to truth. He therefore turns in service to those he should be opposing. They might be the legal rulers, called Cornwall and, and Regan, but they have no morals, no compassion. They serve only their own position and power. And that is also true of his other son, Edmund. One of the, one of the delights of this particular play, one of the reasons I describe this as possibly one of the, if not the greatest play ever written, is that within the play itself, it succeeds in investigating so many parts of the human condition and the situations that we find ourselves in. I mean, it's all in there. You might say all human life is encapsulated within this play. That's a very grandiose claim to make, but bear with me for a second on this. For instance, um, we, it sets up a, 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 a very, a very uh, common political problem. To be fair to him, Gloucester tries to be the honest broker between a king who has no power and a powerful duke who wants to be king. It's an absolutely impossible situation for any civil servant to be in, for anyone to be in, to be the broker between that which was and that which may be, both of which are opposed to one another. Example. Gloucester, who wants to serve his former boss, must also be loyal to his new boss. And a man, in spite of Goldoni's rather wonderful comedy, a man cannot be servant to two masters. And Gloucester is about to discover this. He thinks he can because he doesn't see clearly. Lear has arrived at Gloucester's castle, where Cornwall uh, and Regan are now in residence because they don't want Lear to go to their house. Lear wants to speak with them, so he, he's left Goneril, as we looked at last week, and now wants to move in with Regan, together with this retinue of a hundred knights. But neither Regan nor her husband Cornwall will meet him, because they know that the best solution is not to offer a solution. So they, they won't come and talk with him. Gloucester has to bring this information to his boss. Lear can't believe it. Deny to speak with me? Are they, they are sick, they're weary, they've traveled all night, mere fetches. Fetch me a better answer. Go and ask them again. Gloucester, my dear Lord, Lord, you're still my boss. You know the fiery quality of the Duke, how unremovable and fixed he is in his own course. Lear, patience is not his strong point. Vengeance, plague, death, confusion, fiery, what quality? Why, Gloucester, Gloucester, I'd speak with the Duke of Cornwall and his wife. Gloucester, well, my good Lord, I have informed them so. I mean, it's, he is trying so hard to please both sides. Lear, inform them, do you understand me? Yes, my Lord, the King would speak with Cornwall, the dear father would with his daughter speak. Commands, tends service, are they informed of this? Gloucester, God love him. The only response he can make, I would have all well between you. He's a man who not only is stuck in an impossible situation, but he's a man who cannot, who has no, no way of seeing his way through such an impossible situation. He is not equipped for it. He is not politic. He is not conscious of the appalling ways of the world. He tries so hard. He is a noble and honest man. 
And it is Gloucester's blind loyalty to the retired king that makes, because of this, that he makes a very serious error of judgment. When Lear is in extremity, Gloucester goes to help him. Now, he, Cornwall, he has informed them all, leaving them. When, when Lear storms off uh, out onto the heath, um, after his reason not the need speech, uh, Cornwall gives the injunction, lock up the doors. Don't, nobody helps him, leave him alone. He's chosen that course. That's his problem now. Nobody is to help. Gloucester, of course, blindly loyal to the king, uh, decides to help. He feels loyalty to the king as king. He cannot see that the king is no longer king. That the king has is actually nothing in the scheme of power that's going on. That he is an ex-king. Uh, but his humanity leads him. He thinks it's the right thing to do, which of course it is. But that, in a properly ordered, uh, he's committing a crime. In a properly ordered world, it would be seen as a good thing to do, but this is not a properly ordered world anymore. So he makes uh, a dangerous political choice as well as a humane one, and the one which he had he thought it through, had he seen the consequences, he might not have done. Because unfortunately, the choice he makes involves Cordelia, who is now considered an enemy. She is now the Queen of France. So Gloucester is not only going out to help the king against the orders of Cornwall, he is technically committing treason. He is sending the king to the comfort and succor of a foreign power, like his daughter, but it's still an act of treason. Unfortunately, he can't see that. When he gets to Lear, out on the heath, looking for somewhere, he is the one who provides them with the hovel that they shelter in. Good friend, he says to Kent, I pretty take him in thy arms. There's a litter ready, lay him in it. Drive towards Dover, friend, where thou shalt meet both welcome and protection. I have this night a letter received. It is dangerous to be spoken. There's part of a power already landed. Though I doubt for it, the old king, my master, must be relieved. Take, take up, take up, follow me, bring him with you. So he's doing this for the first time, doing something that is both right and because he cannot see what he's doing, phenomenally dangerous. He's committing treason. There is a power that there's an enemy force in our country. He's doing exactly the right thing. But if he was more politic, if he was able to see the consequences of his actions, he might have gone about it very differently. So for this simple act of compassion, he will pay. He will now discover far too late the true nature of Cornwall and Regan, and most especially of his son, Edmund. And as I mentioned last week, these journeys that everybody on is re are really journeys to discover their true nature and for us to see their true nature and for others to observe the true nature of people. And in this sense, Gloucester has to see the true nature of the people in whom he placed his faith. He has to see the true nature of what he believed was an order he could rely upon and depend upon. He has to see that that blind faith in that, that order, that structure, was, as I said earlier on, it's a very fragile thing. And that when that order breaks, chaos ensues. He is now going to see chaos at its worst. It's going to be ugly, and it's going to be terrifying, and it is, <laughs> to, to use a very bad uh, illusion, it really does open his eyes. They, in fact, are going to uh, Regan and Cornwall and his son Edmund, uh, they're going to take out the part of him that he never properly used, his eyes. There is an interrogation, and we all know about those, they still happen today, they, they've been happening since the dawn of time, and interrogations very often 
do not have the purpose which they set out to have. Very often, interrogations are not about finding information, but the sheer joy of torture. And this is torture in its purest sense, because the, the interrogators, Cornwall and Regan and Edmund, well, Edmund has left the room, they know the answers. They just want to taunt Gloucester, and they want to taunt him because he has gone against them. And the one thing that you should not do when power is absolute is take the risk of what that absolute power can do to you just for the sake of vengeance, just for the sake of the pleasure of causing pain. This interrogation is purely for the joy of torturing. And yet they actually managed to get a confession out of them. Regan asked the first question. They all know what the answer is. To whose hands have you sent the lunatic king? Gloucester replies. He tries to be politic. He tries to be clever. It's a bit too late for that. I have a letter guessingly set down, which came from one of a neutral heart and not from one opposed. No, but the letter I have, I mean, I, I, I'm not even sure it's real. I mean, it could be a forgery. And anyway, if it is real, it came from somebody who's probably on our side anyway. He's trying desperately. Cunning says Cornwall, and false, says Regan. They know the answers. Where have you sent the king? To Dover, Gloucester admits. Why for, where for to Dover? Where for to Dover? Now, well, they know why Dover, because it's the closest place to France, and that's where the French army will land. They know all this. They just want to taunt him, because they know what they're going to do to him. Gloucester now is beginning to see it. I am tied to the stake, he says, and I must stand the course. Tied to the stake is very important. Remember, people were burned at the stake, flogged at the stake. The stake is a very significant thing. It's a very significant statement. I know what you're going to do. You're going to make me suffer. Still, Regan asks, wherefore to Dover? She's just taunting him. And now he comes out with this wonderful final statement of intent because i would not see thy cruel nails pluck out his poor old eyes nor thy fierce sister in his anointed flesh rash boorish fangs if wolves had at thy gate howled that darn time thou shouldst have said good porter turn the key all cruels else subscribe but i shall see winged vengeance overtake such children and strangely interestingly in that speech gloucester puts the idea the very idea of eye plucking into the scene. Cornwall responds, see it shalt thou never. Upon these eyes of thine I'll set my foot. And pulls out one of Gloucester's eyes. I mean, you've seen it in the movies, it's a horrible thing. And it's surprisingly easy. Don't try it at home. Regan, of course, Taking somebody's eye out is a terrible thing. But Regan, of course, being Regan, takes it one step further. One side will mock the other. The other two. Now Gloucester understands. Now he has no eyes. And therefore, because he has no eyes, now he can see the truth. Now he has clear sight. Now he sees that he is a victim of the chaos that his world has become. He's thrown out, blind, just thrown out onto the, onto the street. But he makes the first statement of realization, he sees clearly something. I have no way and therefore want no eyes. I stumbled when I saw, and also the realization of the huge mistake he made. Oh, dear son Edgar, might I but live to see thee in my touch, I'd say I had eyes again. So the removal of his eyes, almost within moments of the removal of his eyes, he suddenly, finally begins to see. His journey is well underway. He's not all the way there yet because he is in despair and he's in despair. I suppose one might say he is in despair because of that realization, because the very fabric 
that delicate fabric that held the world together for him has been shattered. And chaos is all that rules now. And in that moment, Shakespeare, being Shakespeare, reunites Gloucester with his banished son. Gloucester doesn't know it. All he sees, in that sense, is a mad beggar. But Edgar, under the guise of Mad Tom, sees the horror of his father's suffering. And again, one of the great truisms of this play, because it is true of all suffering, it is true of all wars, it is true of all pandemics, it is true of everything rotten that can happen in this world. Because we constantly say it, can't get any worse than this. Whoa, 2020 has surprises for you. The, the line that Shakespeare gives uh, Edgar in this moment is quite, is quite superb. Who can say I am the worst? I am worse than e'er I was. The worst I may be yet, yet the worst is not, so long as we can say this is the worst. If we truly believe that things cannot get worse than this, boy, has life, has nature, has the universe got surprises for us. You know, you see these uh, uh, images constantly at the moment of, you know, the pandemic is our big, big problem. Uh, the economy is the big problem after that. And then there's another big problem after that. And then climate change has news for us. It's going to get worse. No matter how bad you think things are, they can always get worse. Things can be the best. But they'll not necessarily ever be the worst. It's one of the purest demonstrations of extremity of this tragedy that we're dealing with. And it very much predicts the level of calamity that the play will lead us to. The worst is not, so long as we can say this is the worst. All the way through this play, things get worse and worse and worse. It gets bad, it gets badder, it gets baddest, but it never really gets baddest, because the baddest is yet to come. So, Gloucester, deceived by one son, wrongly condemned the other, he's been misled, he's confused, He's become bewildered by events over which he has no control. He has seen his family break down. The king he loyally supports, he's seen basically lose all sense of reason. And his world has turned upside down. In an act of tremendous loyalty, he went to the aid of his king, his king. And he's betrayed by the son he most trusted and as a reward, his eyes have been plucked out. And here he is, a blind beggar on the road, being led about by a mad beggar. As he says, tis the time's plague when madmen lead the blind. He doesn't realize, of course, that that's his true son. As ever in his life, he cannot see the truth. He's yet to gain insight. And now he wants to die. He fervently believes in a world of order, a world with, the, as I said at the beginning, gods in his heaven, the kings on his throne, but that world has gone. It has gone forever. We're beginning to realize that, I suppose, in our own lives. The whole effect of the pandemic is changing so many aspects of the way we live, that the world we know, the world that I grew up in, the world that, you know, that the boomers knew. We lived in a blessed time. We lived in the 60s. That world has gone. And we do not know if it will ever quite come back again the way it was. There is no certainty. So the world of God's in his heaven and the king's on his throne, gone for good. The king is no longer a king. The gods have treated him very unjustly, not the way he expected. Chaos is now king. And the gods of chaos now look down from their heaven. As flies to wanton boys are we to the gods. They kill us for their sport. This terrible realization, he finally sees it. He finally sees it, that it is not a benevolent universe, that it is not a benevolent world, that it is in fact a cruel world, and that once you take away that fabric of order, that fabric of civilization, point I made last week, 
um, that uh, civilization is nature's way of trying to put order into the chaos of things. When you take away that order, chaos will always ensue. So, he wants to die. He asks this mad beggar to lead him to a cliff top so that he can throw himself off it. Now here, interestingly, we come to one of the most fascinating scenes, uh, one of the most, I think, one of the most uh, remarkable pieces of theatrical invention in the whole of Shakespeare. Um, we're going to see something that is both dramatically true within the play, but also a quite majestic trick of theater. Now we know the nature of Shakespeare's stage, whether it was outdoor at the Globe or indoors at the Blackfriars, it was still an empty space. It was a flat platform on which we are always enjoined to bring our imagination to bear. Let me remind you of a little piece of the prologue to Henry V Act I, because that explains it in, 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 in great clarity. Pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? Oh, pardon. Since a crooked finger may attest at a little place a million, let us ciphers to this greater come on your imaginary forces work. Shakespeare has always laid out that notion that what you see on the stage is subject to your own imagination, your capacity to imagine, and that the words, that words themselves can place you somewhere else, that a suggestion to your imagination can create an entire army of cavalry, that you can see a thousand archers where there are four. That's the way the theatre works. It works upon your imagination. And in this coming scene with Gloucester and, and Edgar, we're about to see that used so herbly, both as a piece of theatrical chicanery, if you like, but also as a piece of um, psychological agility on the part of Edgar to try to save his father. He uses guile, Edgar, he uses trickery. He wants to shock his father back to an acceptance that life is what matters. No matter how bad it is, life is what matters. No matter how badly you want it to end, you must survive. It's a lesson that Edgar has learned for himself. Remember, by this point, Edgar, who within an hour went from second, second in line to the, 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 the title Gloucester to a mad bedlam beggar, one hour, and he had given up everything. He reduced himself to nothing willingly to survive. That's how far he would go to survive. He has, as Mad Tom, witnessed the insanity of his king, of Lear. He knows how bad things can get, but he still believes that it is better to survive than to surrender to the inevitable it isn't inevitable one can that one can survive one may think this is the worst but the worst is not so long as we can say this is the worst there is still hope so on an empty flat stage representing an empty flat piece of ground Edgar must convince Gloucester that he is at the very top of a cliff Question is asked by Gloucester, when shall I come to the top of that same hill? Edgar, you do climb up it now. Look how we labor. Edgar is mad Tom, remember. Gloucester, methinks the ground is even. Horrible steep, says mad Tom. Do you not hear the sea? No, says Gloucester. Well, then your other senses grow imperfect by your eyes anguish. Constantly trying to convince him we are climbing up a hill and there's a cliff and the sea is at the bottom of it. And how is Gloucester to know? I always imagine this notion of him, of, of Edgar, with Gloucester on the end of a stick and Edgar pulling up all the time to make Gloucester stagger so he thinks he's going uphill. But it is vitally important that there is no hill, there is no edge, no matter, not even, not even six inches. It is a flat 
flat platform. Because Shakespeare wants us to see the trick that Edgar is pulling, to see the, uh, the majesty of that moment of theatrical genius that is carried out in life. So Edgar is playing on our imagination just as much as he's playing on Gloucester's. In Shakespeare, in that sense, wants the audience to see what Gloucester can only imagine, but in a sense that we become Gloucester with him, that we join in that process. It's, it, it's quite brilliant. Eventually, Edgar decides the time has come. Come here, sir, here's a place, stand still. And then he goes on with the illusion. How fearful and dizzy it is to cast one's eyes so low. The crows and coughs that wink the midway air show scarce so gross as beetles. Halfway down hangs one that gathers samphire. Dreadful trade. Methinks he seems no bigger than his head. You, people used to get samphire from the cliff edges and climb up to get it and die in the process. The fishermen that walk upon the beach, be, uh, the beach appear like mice. The murmuring surge that on the unnumbered idle pebble chafes cannot be heard so high. I love that phrase. Oh, isn't that beautiful? The sound of the sea on a pebbly beach. The murmuring surge that on the unnumbered idle pebble chafes cannot be heard so high. I'll look no more lest my brain turn and the deficient sight tumble, topple down headlong. So he has built this brilliant image. He's told Gloucester, <clears throat> you are on a cliff edge. He goes that step further and describes how high it is. And Gloucester has bought it. Gloucester has accepted it completely. He believes he is where Mad Tom Edgar has described. And so do we. We're traveling this journey with him. And if the play works well, the audience accepts, almost believes that it's one of those magic tricks and you know what's gonna happen and you know what's gonna happen. And then when it does, you're shocked, you're surprised. Gloucester says, set me where you stand. Edgar keeps that illusion going. Give me your hand. You're now within a foot of the extreme verge. For all beneath the moon, I would not leap upright. Gloucester, let go my hand. Go further off. Bid me farewell and let me hear thee going. And Edgar pretends to go away. Farewell, bye. And Gloucester is left alone. And Gloucester, with one brief prayer, makes that final decision, the jump. And he does. But that prayer is an admission of his own inability to accept chaos. So he puts himself into the hands of the gods. This world I do renounce, and in your sights shake patiently my great affliction off. If I could, if I could bear it longer, and not fall to quarrel with your great opposeless wills, my snuff and loathed part of nature should burn itself out. In other words, if I could deal with it, I'd live through it, but I can't deal with it. If Edgar lived, bless him, and he jumps. And he really believes he's jumping to his death. Hits the floor in that moment. That has to stun him. That has to make him, he must, something, probably shock. But he's not dead. He's been tricked by the madman. And he must now make another discovery. He must finally see another new truth. Edgar, being a good actor, changes his voice and his identity yet again. This is the most stunningly brilliant piece of theatricality on Shakespeare's part. He's even got one of his major characters performing like an actor. He's demonstrating not just the thematic of his play, not just the thematic of the philosophy behind his play, but the very nature of the form of theater through which he can make that demonstration. Edgar must now bring his father back to the world of the living no matter how awful that world may be and how living in it may be so bad. And he goes over, probably prods him with his foot, alive or dead, you, sir, friend, hear you, speak. Who are you, sir? 
Gloucester says, go away, I want to die. And then Shakespeare does the complete reverse of what he did in the earlier part of the scene. And thou been off but gossamer feathers air, so many fathom down precipitating, thou shiver like an egg. But you now breathe. Ten masts at each make not the altitude which thou hast perpendicularly fell. Thy life's a miracle. Speak yet again. So many things in that. Describing to Gloucester the distance that he fell, which of course was no distance at all. Using words so precisely to fill Gloucester's sightless imagination with images. Ten masts at each make not the altitude which thou hast perpendicularly fell. Your life's a miracle. Somebody wants you to live. Something wants you to live. And Gloucester, but, well, did I fall? Yeah, from the dread summit of this chalky bourne, look up a height. The shrill gorge lark so far cannot be seen or heard. Now remember, from the top he was talking about the crows at the bottom. Now he's at the bottom talking about the larks at the top. He's doing this brilliant job of making Gloucester see. Gloucester responds, I have no eyes. Is wretchedness deprived that benefit to end itself by death? Can I not die? Gloucester, you see, has believed that he surrendered his life to the gods. But he said, I can't deal with this. I can't deal with your opposeless wills. You have made your minds up about the way the world should be, and I can't cope with it. I'm just, I'm surrendering to you. But in fact, there was no surrender. And there was no surrender because there were no gods. Only fate. And fate, his fate, put him into the hands of his son. And his son made him survive. And his realization that there are no gods, that nothing will work right, that everything is chaos, makes him accept that point. Henceforth, I'll bear affliction till it do cry out itself enough, enough, and die. I will put up with what the world gives me. The worst is not so long as we can say this is the worst. The gods will not accept my sacrifice of death. The gods don't care. The gods, in that sense, don't exist. I will put up with it. He has learned, he has begun truly to see the world for the way that it is, the gods for the way that they are. And he has learned that he must accept it. He must resign himself to the inevitability of what he is. And he gets his final lesson from Lear. And as we, we examined last week, when we looked at the scene between Gloucester and the blind Gloucester and the mad Lear, a man may see how the world goes with no eyes. Lear in his madness is teaching Gloucester how to see. And you see with your ears. You see with your imagination. You see with the wisdom that you accrue. Gloucester has gone on that journey from blindness to a true level of sight by losing his eyes. It's a very grotesque parody. Gloucester learns he must endure, he must accept the world or accept what the world has become and it is a world of chaos. So that's the other journey he's gone on from order to chaos. And it's a hard journey and it has cost him so much Death will come in its own time. And indeed, before the play is over, he does succumb to death. There is no need to surrender to it. Death will come. The final lesson that he has to learn. So, Gloucester's journey. Um, in our third discussion, which will be next week, we're going to bring the other characters um, to the end of their journeys and see how, basically, how Lear concludes his own journey and the lessons that, that the last moments will teach him, the final lessons that chaos has to teach him. I do believe that uh, the, 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 the truest thing in this play is that once Lear is no longer king, chaos is king. And that is the lesson that so many of them have to learn. Um, somebody has a question there. The blindness theme is very much similar to, to Oedipus, to Oedipus. 
did Shakespeare read Sophocles? Shakespeare, I imagine, read everything he could get his hands on. And I certainly know that, that he was certainly familiar with, with Greek drama because the very formulation of plot line and um, uh, the conceptualization of plots um, has very clear links to, to the Greek. So yes, I, I have no doubt whatsoever that Shakespeare would have been a, um, a reader. Uh, let's have a look at some of the other questions there. Uh, uh, me. Yes, Grace, your point is uh, uh, concerning um, the, the literary device of, of taking vision physically as a metaphor, highlighting psychological vision and enlightenment. Um, yeah, and I think that is true. I think Shakespeare, Shakespeare didn't write these, you know, luckily. He thought very clearly about what he was writing. And he unquestionably must have been a remarkable observer of the nature of people around him. I mean, I still think that that the fundamental narcissistic nature of Lear was based on that of, of Henry VIII. Um, because, you know, we tend to, to be very more familiar with the history that is recent to us than the history that is far distant to us. And for Shakespeare, born in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, um, would very much be conscious of the effects, the political and social effects that Henry VIII's life um, had on the whole of England. And so therefore, I do think that that, that, that would have been present in his thinking. Uh, but yes, the... Um, some would suggest psychological blindness as a way to enlightenment is almost... Yeah, it, it's... Yeah, it's, it's again, it's clever thinking. It's in, if in terms of music, it's point and counterpoint. Um, that... Shakespeare can mix these two journeys together. They're traveling a different course, they're traveling for a different purpose, but they keep interlocking because there are similarities in human nature. Human nature is human nature. Um, and they will always have points which can sort of cross fertilize each other. It's very clever writing. Uh, there is, an, uh, yes, the Lear story, um, again, Shakespeare was renowned for never coming up with an original plot. Uh, this does have um, origins, in, I, what's the name of the character, it's gone from my head now. Uh, but there was a much older story, a very different name, uh, of a king and his daughters. Um, and it's been repeated throughout literature for you know a very long time. Shakespeare stole the plot fundamentally. Uh, and it's been used, by the way, if, if you're looking at interesting Lears, I mean, there are so many available on... on, on uh, online uh there's a very interesting russian uh lear and if you've never seen it kurosawa the japanese director wrote a beautiful made a beautiful film called ran r-a-n uh which is a lear story um that's magnificent and i heartily recommend you watching that uh but yes it wasn't an original story um the other points there um Uh, there's nothing I can see, uh, but as I say, if you have any questions about anything that we talk about, always remembering that everything I tell you might be wrong. But um, if you do have any questions, post the, the, the webinar. Always feel free, drop us an email. Um, uh, yeah, there you go, but Jeffrey, that's true. Yes, James, thank you. The, uh, the Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of England mentions Lear, but it also mentions, I think, King Arthur as well. Um, they're legendary. Uh, but all good stories are based somewhere historically on something that probably happened. Um, we rehire, nothing is original. No ideas, no thoughts, no plots are original. It's all based on reimagined, reconsidered, uh, rethought. What I do find fascinating brilliant about this particular play is how Shakespeare takes so many themes, so many themes of the human condition and just molds them all together in this wonderful paralleling of storylines um, and the use of theatrical trickery, games, the games that theater is made up of, uses it so beautifully. And I think, as I say, the, the, uh, the Dover Cliff 
episode between Gloucester and Mad Tom, well, Gloucester and Edgar, is one of the most remarkable uses of, of how theater works that anybody has ever written. Um, its simplicity, its beauty. Um, if Beckett were writing that scene, I think that's how he would write it as well. It, it, it has this theatrical purity that is quite remarkable. Um, yes, yeah, Ran is a wonderful film. Everybody should watch it, watch it. The Russian movie is King Lear. Um, so that's what you look for. Just look for the Russian King Lear on, on uh, Google that and it'll probably turn up. The same director, I think, did a remarkable Hamlet as well, uh, which is also very much worth watching. So anyway, there we are. We're, uh, we're over time as usual. Um, next week, we will have um, the third in our programs about King Lear. And next week, we'll have big announcements about our radio dramas. Um, so I want to, uh, I want to thank Arnold again for sponsoring this. If you're interested in sponsoring your program, send us an email, send us a text, text us on Facebook, whatever way you like, um, and we'll give you all the information, all the details. If you don't want or can't afford to sponsor a whole program, do please consider sending us a donation. I know in this particular time in the United States, people are being asked for money for various donations, some political. Uh, they're fine. We need your help. We always need your help. Um, we can't go back on stage. We're creating other forms of, of entertainment as much as we can. But we can't sell tickets for plays. So please, if you can send a donation, and as I keep saying, it doesn't have to be huge, what you can afford, please send it. Uh, if you sent one before, thank you very much. Please send another. We do need that help. Uh, we will keep going and we will fight to keep going to bring you the best we can of classical theatre, of Irish theatre, of these webinars, uh, of other guests, which we'll have on in, in future weeks. But we do need your support. So don't hesitate. Don't think that we'd be embarrassed. We won't. We'll take whatever donation you can give us. Thank you so much for being here. We will see you all again next week, I hope. In the meantime, wash your hands, wear your mask, and take good care. Bye now. <laughs>